This is the word of the Lord. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Good morning, the Lord is with you. We're in a battle, not in a battle against flesh and blood. If you're in a battle with flesh and blood, we've got some pretty clear instructions about how to deal with human beings. We're called to love them, but we are in a spiritual battle. The Bible talks about principalities and, and powers, and uh, you may or, not, may or may not agree with that. You may or may not have evidence uh, to support that claim or even to debunk it. But Jesus knows that we're in a battle. And so part of the prayer that he gave us to pray includes these words, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. And what he's saying very clearly is there's a force at work in our world. There's a power that's at work and it's, uh, it's at work inside of us and it comes at us from the outside, wells up envy and, and jealousy inside of us. That's, that's what temptation is. We want what someone else has got and we start to figure out a plan to get that for ourselves. Or we've experienced evil from the outside, injustice, our bullying, um, sorts of things where there's corruption in leadership. And we know this world is awesome and yet there's some pieces to it that are deeply broken deeply troubled. Well, what's the problem with temptation? What's the problem with evil for that matter? It, it brings about sin. It, it finds us not being fully human. In fact, the things that Satan wants to sell us on, they're, they're boring. They're dull. They don't start out feeling dull. No, they feel exhilarating when we're in the moment of breaking the rule, of having the secret, of sneaking around. But it doesn't take too long for sin to once again fail to deliver on all that it promises. And we find ourselves getting less human, more wrinkly. The air gets stale. Sin is dull and it makes us dull. What we've been called into by the living God is, is kingdom come. What we've been called into is the, the name that is to be hallowed. What, what we've been called into is having our wills aligned with the, with the heart of creation. And so we pray this prayer, among other things. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from the evil one. There is a little bit of confusion, right? There's a little bit of confusion in that statement, lead us not into temptation. Like temptation is, is Satan's deal, right? That's Satan trying to get us off task. That's Satan trying to distract us. So why would we ever need to pray, lead us not into temptation? Isn't God's heart for us that we just be fully alive in Him? It's more like um, the way Hebrews framed things. There's always sort of like one phrase and then a, a second phrase. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. These two things are Jesus saying a couple of things to us. And for sure this, does God tempt us? Does God put the chocolate cake on the kitchen counter at 3 a.m. and, and sort of call our name? No, that's, that's not God. Those are different fingerprints. Those are the fingerprints of trauma and of temptation. They are the ones of the evil one. God's heart for us is to walk with us through temptation. Actually, Jesus tells three stories. You can check out uh, Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, if you look a little bit later on in Luke chapter 11, some of you folks, you're enjoying doing this. You press pause on me and you open your Bible, turn it over to Luke 11. Jesus tells three stories that I think really have power to affect us in our praying. Three stories that open our eyes up to what spiritual warfare includes. The first story begins with Jesus casting out uh, a demon from a man. So there was a, a mute spirit that had taken over a man's body. Jesus is walking by him and he casts this demon out, says, be gone. And in fact, the man can talk. And the whole crowd is going crazy. They love it, except for some people. Some people were 
envious of Jesus. They didn't like the popularity that he had. And so they began to try to explain it away. And they said, it's by the prince of demons that Jesus casts out demons. Beelzebub. That's the way it's happening here. Demon casting out demon. Jesus says, you know, there's a rare occasion when if you're a firefighter, you fight fire with fire. It's a, it's a rare strategy, but it never works with evil. You don't put more evil on top of evil and that makes less evil. Evil adds to evil and good adds to good. You can't fight evil with evil. Jesus said a kingdom divided against itself will not stand. So what he's saying there is that temptation isn't him. He's not behind it. In fact, if I can say it this way, he's opposed to every form of evil. He's opposed to every temptation, wants to invite us out of it. So don't blame God for it, but for sure invite him into it. <clears throat> when I was about 20 years old, I uh, was struggling with a couple of different temptations and I was reading my Bible. And I thought I was the first person to discover this verse, but I came across 1 Corinthians, it was chapter 10, verse 13, and it says, Something like this, no temptation has seized you except what is common to people. And God is faithful. He'll provide a way for you to stand up under it. That one, that was really helpful. So I, I would be praying, just take the temptation away, God. Just don't let it happen. I don't want to be tempted. But that's not what God asks us to pray. He's like, actually, invite me into the middle of this. And when we do, God says, I'll show you a way out. Two, two things that verse helped me with. One thing is that in my temptation, 20 years old, <clears throat> I thought no one else on the planet was experiencing what I was experiencing. I mean, I had the mother load of, you know, temptation, the big challenge. I was unique. I was special. And when I read that verse, I realized God was saying to me, on this matter, Andrew, you're not. You're not unique. You're not special. What you got is common. What you're dealing with is normal. This temptation, this is vanilla flavor. That's what this is. And that kind of took away my, I kind of had myself, you know, an allowance. I could allow myself this indulgence of temptation, this entry into sin, because I was dealing with more than anybody else was dealing with. And God told me in very clear terms, no, you're not. Not at all. The second thing that it assured me of was that God was in this and that he would always provide a way out. This has been my experience. I'm thinking about doing something sinful and the phone rings. I'm thinking maybe temptation and the door gets knocked on. I, I'm thinking and someone all of a sudden wants to talk and I'm like, man, Holy Spirit, you provide a way out. There is always a way out when it comes to temptation. Always. God promises that's the way it is. So that's a great picture when you're praying. Right? That Jesus is opposed to evil and that he will provide a way out. Second story that Jesus told in, uh, in Luke, and this I think was to explain this, deliver us from the evil one. He told a story about a strong man, a strong man who's armed and he's got his possessions in his house <clears throat> and the door is bolted and he's clutching. And he's actually, Jesus, I think, uses the word safe. He's safe until, he said, but when someone who is stronger attacks and overpowers him and takes away his armor, the strong man is outnumbered, outpowered, outstrengthened. And uh, the way that Jesus finishes this statement is, he says, and he divides up the strong man's plunder. The stronger man divides up the strong man's plunder. In the story, very clearly, Jesus is saying that Satan, the evil one, is the strong man. He's strong and he's got possessions and he's armed and he's trying to hold humans hostage. But when the stronger man comes and Jesus is saying, that's me, when I come, I'm going to take that away from him. And in fact, that's what Jesus did on the cross. He, he took away what Satan was hanging on to and he set us free. Uh, what's really cool about that passage and one of the sort of favorite lines in me, for me in that are, the, uh, and he divides up the plunder. If you're reading your Bible and you get into some of the stories in the Older Testament, in the in Early Testament, um, evil kings are on the scene fairly often. And there's a similar line that happens with evil kings. They get the plunder and they keep it for themselves. They, hey, build another shed out back because I'm going to take all that plunder that we just got from that successful military victory and I'm going to keep it for myself. 
The exception was the good kings. The good kings divided up the plunder, you know, gave to other people, shared the wealth. This is a great picture of what Jesus does on the cross. The stronger man, what he's done for us, sets us free and shares the good stuff. Everybody goes home richer because of what Jesus has done. So he's opposed to evil and he's stronger than the evil one. And then there's this other thing that really, this other story that helps shape us when we pray, deliver us from the evil one. And it's this. Jesus told the third story about a man, well actually told it about an impure spirit that was in a man and for some reason left. We just can only imagine the story that he's told about or this thing that he's just cast out of the mute spirit that Jesus has cast out of this man. And he says, so this, the man is free. The way he says it is he's, he's clean and everything is in order. It's like his house is empty. And the impure spirit leaves him and goes into the wilderness, comes back, finds the man empty and goes and gets seven other spirits worse than himself. And they all eight of them take over this guy's life again. And Jesus says, and the guy's life is worse now the second time than it was the first time when it was just one demon. What's, what's he saying there? He's saying, for sure I don't lead you into temptation and for sure I will deliver you from the evil one. But the the third point that he's making is, you know, you want to keep your life filled. You want to keep your life filled with me. It isn't enough to say, Jesus, would you just clean up my life? Would you just take away the hard stuff? And when he does, and he will, he casts out demons, he cleans up the house. But when he does, if you say, thanks for the clean house, and I'll take it from here, Jesus is saying, you're toast. You're toast if you think that you can navigate the world, this world that includes a spiritual realm, spiritual element. You're toast if you believe that you can do this by yourself. Right? Do this. I invite you to do this. Jesus instructs you to do this. Invite him into your life for today and for forever. You know, the last thing I'm going to say is, <clears throat> I just want to remind you that this prayer is plural. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one, right? This is the way that we pray. It's not about just get me out of this problem. God has always intended for us to do this together. There was a time in my life where I was struggling with, with an area of sin and, and I remember praying again. This was later in my 20s, maybe early 30s. God, just take it away. Take the temptation away. And I prayed it for a year, maybe a year and a half. And I remember the spot on the road where I was and I felt like, so I'm Presbyterian, so I can't say, oh, God talked to me, but I felt like God was speaking to me. I remember the spot where it hit me, where God said, you want me to take away that temptation? I was like, yes, I do. And he said, because you don't want to do the hard work of having to get honest with another person. Yeah, he was right. I just wanted to be a poster boy for what God would do. Look how amazing I am. And I could see that what I really needed to do wasn't just to be delivered from temptation, but was to grow up, was to learn how to be honest, was to step into real community. Real community isn't when I pretend to be perfect and look at all the amazing things God's done for me and you pretend to be perfect and look at all the amazing things God's doing for you. Real community is when we're honest, when we're vulnerable, when we're real. So last, last thing, on a real note, you know, this speaking about, preaching about spiritual warfare always kicks up dust for me. And uh, it was no different this week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, I'm getting this anxious feeling in my chest. It's getting heavier and heavier and I'm out for a walk with my best friend. And I'm explaining to her, like, I just have this little oppressive feeling. and I, I'm not sure what to do about it. I'm teaching people about how Jesus is stronger and how he's opposed to evil and Jesus just needs to fill your life. And my best friend says to me, have you prayed about this? <laughs> have you prayed about this? And it just struck me. You know, my heart in this, and I think Jesus' heart in this, isn't just to teach you about praying. It's really to get you, to get us, to get me to, into the business of praying. So let me just encourage you. You know, the video shut off. You would take some time to pray right there on the couch, wherever you're sitting. Let's just pray that prayer. You know, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let's do this. Honest, vulnerable, real, together. In the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forever. Amen. Amen.